Hello and welcome to Fleet Auto News Podcast. I'm Caroline Falls and today I'm speaking with Max Wang, a Senior Product Manager at Intelematics, a pioneer Australian telematics group and a unit of RACV, the Royal Automobile Club of Victoria. Max is behind Intelematics award-winning product Arivo, which is a journey planning app, or in today's lingo, a MAS product. That's mobility as a service. Let's get Max to tell us all about it and how it fits in with drives towards a circular economy and also how it can help businesses meet sustainability goals. Welcome, Max. Hey, Caroline. Thanks for uh, having me here. Firstly, let's just do a MAS 101 so we don't lose any listeners who don't really get what we're talking about. Yeah, what cool. is MAS? When did we start hearing about MAS? And what is Intelematics doing in the MAS universe? Yeah, sure. Uh, so MAS, or Mobility as a Service, uh, is a concept that dates back, I'd say, probably uh, the past five to ten years. Um, and only more recently it started to, to gain a bit more traction. But um, it's a broad term and, uh, and it's sort of taken on more meanings as, as time's gone on. But uh, at, back at its at its core, it, it was really referring to this idea of making making transport as easy, accessible um, and sustainable as possible. So uh, I guess the best way to, to describe it's often often used as an, an analogy is the Netflix of, of transport. So uh, effectively being able to wrap up a bunch of different modes of transport from a bunch of different transport service providers into what you might consider a package or, or a monthly subscription, whereby you might get an allocation of uh, free public transport, 10 taxi rides, um, a number of scooter rides, and that might cost you something like 200 euro per month. Um, and I use euro because that's that's where the first, uh, in Europe is where, where the first MAS um, services originated from one of the um, one of the founding founding organizations of this MAS concept is uh, an organization called WIM based out of Helsinki and um, since then it's really propagated throughout the globe there's been this idea of uh, you know this, this business model where everything gets gets incorporated into this this one platform it often takes the form of, of an app but um, you know as, as the MAS term has, has expanded, it, it often is used interchangeably with just mobility in general, which includes things like e-scooters, car car sharing, ride hailing, um, all those sorts of new new transport types and modes. And and just to finish off that question, yeah. like what is Intelematics doing in, in the MAS universe? Yeah, so all right. So Intelematics and um, just to extend on what you were uh, on the introduction there, Caroline, and, and Telemax has historically been uh, primarily a, a, I guess, a, a car-centric organisation. You know, we were born out of a consortium of, of auto clubs here in Australia who were looking into how we could provide uh, value-added services to the auto industry, things like um, emergency calls. So if someone was having an accident in a vehicle, um, being able to automatically call emergency services, uh, a bunch of telematics services as well and then you know traffic data that was our that was our core for for quite some time and then more recently with this advent of mo mobility as a service and trends away from you know private vehicle ownership towards uh, more sustainable modes of transport Intelematics, along with its parent company RACV have been looking into how we can how we can better service the, the general public and our members and customers um, how we can help them uh, with, with the goal of moving around, uh, but you know maybe not necessarily purely um, through through vehicle ownership. So hence why we are very interested in this MAS space. And uh, with our technology background, we've decided to to make a play at creating a a MAS a MAS platform, um, which has taken the form of a of a mobile app with a lot of you know, back end smarts, your know, multimodal. Um, route planning um and you know we're looking into things like like payments uh bluetooth enablement of, of parking uh, and all that sort of stuff as well and that's the arevo app that we mentioned earlier yeah look so um just to touch on on i guess how we how we operate is um arevo is one of the uh one of the consumer or the end user facing 
applications that that's built on our Intelematics MAS platform. We've also done some work with Transport for New South Wales, whereby we created a a bike riding centric app uh, using or leveraging certain components uh, that are common to to Arivo, but you know really um, I guess augmenting that that cycling part of it. So we we have the ability to you know if you think about our Intelematics MAS platform as a suite of different mobility services which service um, active transport like like bike riding, um, they service public transport, uh, micro mobility, a whole lot of different uh, transport types and verticals. Then uh, you know we we we're able to then chunk that out and and you know given its modular nature, we can pick out certain certain use cases, uh, in that case, Transport for New South Wales, but also with Arivo, um, and, and we're able to basically create a, a specific service or, or mobile app that suits uh, wh- whichever client or customer we're, we're doing work with at that point in time. Cool. Um, now, I'm devoted to learning more about the circular economy this year after doing a certificate course on the topic late last year. I... I heard GoGet say a couple of years ago that one GoGet vehicle removes 10 vehicles off the road. <laughs> so it seems to me that the whole sharing model, mm. including subscription models for moving about, is a great example of how we can turn to a more circular economy where mm. materials are either not used mm. or are reused and remanufactured mm. rather than the traditional linear economy when materials are used as if they're endlessly available and then dumped. Mm. Mm. What do you have to say about how MAS aligns with circular economy principles? Yeah, that's right. Like, um, and I think, I think the thing that holds true is that like all, all of those mobility services that we are so dependent on as a MAS, MAS service provider, um, whether it's your go get car sharing or your um, e-scooters, micro mobility, um, yeah, we, we align completely with those with, with the objectives of each of those organizations so um yeah there, there there is absolutely that statistic you know that we also talk about the fact that the average private vehicles parked 95 percent of the time so why does you know, why is almost every household in australia own own a vehicle it's just taking up space and incurring costs so um there is certainly this this idea that when when you adopt a mas or a mobility Kind of mindset that you're you're moving away from this idea of of ownership and more towards just using things on on demand, and um, yeah, even more so when you think about it from a subscription point of view, is that uh, you're really just subscribing to this um, this concept of being able to access access transport, and you don't actually have to have to necessarily own anything. So it's about maximizing utilization, reducing waste, um, and there's a lot of a lot of benefits that come from that, right? Like you know, we know that about a quarter of all energy related um or a, qu- a quarter of all carbon dioxide emissions are, are energy related so uh particularly given that a lot of these micro mobility service providers and um you know public transport is, is generally considered to be you know fairly fairly green uh the more people that we can convince to, to use those modes rather than taking their own private vehicle the better but the one caveat i'd give there is that um you know, one thing that I'd, I'd say Intellimax is doing differently from a lot of other MAS providers around the world is that we're not neglecting the private vehicle. So it does seem as if you know, we're building for the future where you know, we're accounting for uh, less people owning cars. But at the same time, we know that in Australia, the car is still king. And if we were to completely ignore that, then we'd be, um, we'd be missing the opportunity to take existing car owners on that journey towards that new that new mobility future. So one thing we are doing is we are, we are still catering uh, for, for vehicle owners. So we've got um, services like parking uh, that we're incorporating into our platform, which make it easy for people to find parking quicker. So they're not driving around the the city um, aimlessly burning fuel. Um, And I think there's another statistic that suggests about a quarter of all, all traffic that you see within the CBD is actually people looking for parking, which doesn't surprise me. So being able to um, show them, uh, up up to date information around which segments of of road have have free parking spots can direct them to to, to find a park quicker, but also we're doing some work around uh, EV charge point on aggregation as well. So working with the charge point operators um, to be able to make it easier for and more convenient for EV 
owners to, to find where they can where they can charge and how, how they can pay easily as well. Um, so so I guess in summary, yeah, we're, we're doing a few things um, to promote this this idea of a um, you know, circular economy, uh, but at the same time, you know what, we're not jumping straight there. We're we're trying to take take existing users and, and just the general public on on the journey with us. Mm. You say car is king in Australia, and I, I've heard you say that a couple of times at conferences like the AFMA conference where you gave a great presentation a few years ago, mm. and more recently at the National Roads and Traffic Expo in Sydney earlier this year. Mm. Is why I wanted you on this podcast to talk to our audience and, uh, you know, talk about this car is uh, king in Australia. Mm. Do, you, do you think you know, is that shifting at all? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And uh, I mean, I, I feel like it, it's kind of a, a very timely thing to talk about given given COVID and the fact that, you know, we, we were heading in a certain trajectory, uh, particularly with a bunch of these, these new mobility modes becoming made available pre-COVID. Uh, and then COVID hit and um, it kind of set, it felt like it set us back a few years uh, in the sense that, there, there are now more people um, in their cars driving, driving to and from work, um, and, and we know this data from from the data that that Intellimatics collects um, through through our other our other data products is that uh, there are certain segments of road that are now much busier than they were pre COVID, um, indicating that there's more people driving their cars. So, um, yeah, it, it is it is a thing where it just feels like um, it, it's so. It's so hard to make progress in the other direction, but it's so easy to sort of fall back into these old old habits. But having said that, look, I, I think that there's there's some still positive trends, and whether it is whether it does involve the the private vehicle or not, I think there's there's still ways that we're able to contribute to you know, society's sustainability goals. Uh, whether it's through EVs, and there's, there's been a huge uptake of uh, EVs, particularly with the subsidies that are coming through. Uh, I know in absolute terms it's not huge, but uh, relative to to where Australia was tracking before, it's it, it, it's actually pretty impressive, um, and and then you know oh, I guess one of the one of the other things that that has come to light is um, the the e scooter trials that have just recently launched in in Melbourne are going I guess far far better than anyone ever expected, particularly with some of the uh, the false starts with some of the the bike sharing schemes over the years, um, you know, the, the O-bike debacle a few years ago uh, where half of them end up in the Yarra. So it looks like they're, the operators have really taken heed and, and learned from the mistakes of, of previous other operators and seems like the, the schemes that are currently running are being run quite responsibly. And I forget the exact figure, but it was well over a million trips that have, or, or a million kilometres at least that have been taken uh, with just a couple of these these e-scooter operators here in Melbourne over the, the, I think the first three months of the trial. So um, yeah, very promising stats uh, in one regard, but also unsurprising um, in the other with the, you know, the number of people that are returning back to the car as well. So it kind of feels almost like a, a, a two speed sort of uh, economy going on there, but um, you know, in, interest, an interesting space to monitor definitely. We'll be back after a short break for a word from our sponsor, Sofico Services. Sofico is a world-leading provider of enterprise software for the automotive leasing, finance, and mobility industry. For more than 30 years, international leasing companies and OEMs count on Sofico's expertise and technology to help them transform innovative product concepts into streamlined business processes and engaging customer experiences. With more than 370 experts, eight offices on four continents, and an annual growth averaging 15%, Sofico is perfectly positioned to help its customers succeed in a rapidly changing market where electrification, shared fleets, and multimodal mobility challenge us and our customers to play a pioneering role. 
Continuous investment in people, innovation, and leading-edge technology is the basis for continued growth and success. And, and, and you know, I wouldn't say necessarily that we're hedging our bets, but we are definitely um, catering for, I guess, a, a range of preferences based on, you know, different people's comfort levels as well. You know, I think there is still this idea of... Um, people being hesitant to jump back on public transport if they can avoid it. So, um, yeah, conscious of that too. Yeah, COVID put a real spanner in the works, didn't it, for trends towards sharing transport? I mean, just look at used car prices increasing as people ditched public transport in favour of their own secure cocoon mm. to move around in. And yeah. um, But, you know, I gather from what you've just said that you you know, can see some sort of positive trend back to getting this sharing model back on track, which was so disrupted by COVID. Mm -mm. Is that that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. And, um, you know, I think the next step there is, um, you know, because, you know, this idea of MAS, as I talked about at the start there, Caroline, uh, whereby, you know, to to really work effectively, you need the... um, the buy-in of the public, you need the uh, the end users to really be engaging with these these mobility services. You know, there's no point building this this amazing platform that enables subscriptions and rewards and all these wonderful things if uh, if people just don't really have a need to use these these scooters and and ride hailing. You know, like if it's just on the fringes, um, it's not really a compelling proposition to tie it all together. So. It is really, it is really promising to see that the scooters is, is getting the traction it is. We already know um, the fact that ride hailing is now so commonplace as well. It's feeling as if uh, the trend towards these new mobility modes, you know, they're not really considered so new anymore, which is which is kind of a cool thing. And it means that um, as there's greater adoption across a range of these different transport types and and different operators as well within each segment, that the role of a MAS operator or, or a MAS platform to, to bring it all together and ensure that all those different modes can be accessed and paid for through a single account, um, just from a user experience point of view, just becomes a lot more a lot more compelling. So definitely starting to see that trend now. Um, it's, it's, def- it's definitely accelerating uh, post, post-COVID, yeah. Now, Max, our podcast targets the fleet audience. And so I'd like you to tell us what you know about fleets, you know, uh, adding car sharing or transport subscriptions yeah. to their organisations. I mean, you might even drop some names of government authorities or private names mm-hmm. that are making such shifts. Yeah, look, it was interesting, actually. I was uh, I was just reading an article last night um, about Siemens in the UK. Uh, I don't remember the exact figures, but it, it, was, it, it was a pretty seismic shift. So uh, they had a certain number of, of fleet vehicles that were available to their staff. Um, and they decided to move to what they called an automated car sharing service, basically, you know, an internal corporate um, car share uh, arrangement whereby instead of having this static fleet of of fleet vehicles that are assigned to their certain employees, um, it became a much smaller pool and you would book them just like you would like a go-get, you know, you would would sort of say when you needed it from, like this is a couple of hours here and there. And then if it was available outside of that, then someone else could book it. Uh, so, so it's kind of like some of these, some of these concepts that are out in the market, the consumers are already using, um, you know, co- companies are starting to adopt and, and implement them within their own, their own fleet environments. So, so I thought that was a pretty cool use case. And uh, I know of some other anecdotal um, uh, examples where, where this, this other companies are doing similar things, uh, but also, uh, the other thing that Intellimax is actually uh, involved with is working with companies uh, on the electrification of their fleets as well. So uh, things like, you know, you think about if, if, if a company provides um, their employees with their EV, they're not necessarily just charging up their cars at work. They're also charging at home. So it's about uh, managing the reimbursements and the expenditure and all that sort of thing when it comes to, that it's it's sort of like the whole fuel card concept, but you know now with with charging, you can kind of charge anywhere. So um, automating that and um, and making that easier for the employer and the employee. So yeah, we're doing we're doing a few things actually in the in the fleet space. 
Yeah, great stuff. And I'm excited about these trends you're talking about. And uh, you've already sort of told us quite a bit about Intelematics, but what about, you know, how long it's been around and, and also about yourself and your mm -hmm. role and um, maybe, you know, what projects you're currently working on, particularly those that foster sustainability? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, in telematics, I, I mean, I'm, I started here just a year and a half ago. Prior to that, I was at Intelimax, um parent company, RACV, uh, working on the Arivo app and a few other things, RACV car share. We were doing some things in the peer-to-peer -peer car rental space as well. Um, so I've been in mobility for, for uh, I guess, like the past five or so years. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I think at the moment, like it's been interesting making that transition from RACV to Intelematics. You know, RACV being obviously very, uh, very member focused. Um, looking at, uh, and I guess this is another stat that's, that's worth calling out is when when we were uh, creating Arevo, about seventy five percent of the people who used Arevo and who created accounts were non RACV members. So, um, and and this is kind of ex exactly what one of the reasons why Arivo was was set up was to help capture a new demographic of users that uh, the RACV club w was was not previously able to capture. So your uh, millennials, you know, urbanites, users that didn't have vehicles. So what it ends up being is it's almost like a funnel uh, that allows the organisation to then cross-sell down the track um, some of its other products and services. So that's just an aside. But, um, you know, then coming across to the Intelematics side, uh, being a lot more technology focused, um, being having this strong history of, uh, of dealing with OEM, so automotive manufacturers, uh, having strong relationships with the other auto clubs around Australia. So being, being a much broader, more national, even international to an extent, uh, ha having that kind of view, um, and then being able to, to look into what, uh, what, what the trends are that's going on um, in the mobility space beyond just, you know, Victoria, being at RACV, you know, you're kind of geographically limited by that. Being in telematics, um, you know, we're, we're really looking at the global players and how we could work alongside them um, to keep growing the, the MAS space. So uh, I guess looking towards the future, yeah, I, I think many of the trends that I've called out here, we're just extending further out. So continuing to do a lot of work um, in active transport. So the work that we did with Transport for New South Wales, we're now talking to um, other, uh, other bike-related organisations who are interested in providing um, very specific, you know, safe cycle routing for their, for their users. Um, and then we're looking into how we can further improve some of those existing car services we talked about, like parking, um, that whole touchless windows up experience, being able to enter and exit out of parking stations and, and, and pay, pay through the phone instead of having to touch um, a ticket booth and, uh, and some of the EV stuff as well. So those are just a few of the things. And then when you, when you think about Maz, that you've got some, some core or hygiene factors uh, that I like to point out, like uh, making sure that the, the multimodal routing or the, or the public tran transport information is up to date and it's live and we're able to provide end users with, uh, with information when there's disruptions of the train or the tram's running late, for instance. So um, it, it's interesting, you know, what one of the people on my team put together this diagram the other day, it was a bit like a spider web, right? We had about like, you know, eight different segments in this, in this chart and each one represented like a different mode of transport. And, you know, you, you kind of don't want to be all things to all people, but at the same time, you know, that is kind of the concept of Maz is <laughs> you, you, you know, it really becomes compelling once you're able to tie in all those different transport modes. So to really map out where we're playing in and to see, you know, the different services that we're offering to each one of those different modes was, was really quite quite an interesting exercise. So, um, yeah, lots of things that we're doing, lots of things that we're looking to do in the future as well. Um, but it's a super exciting space. And even though I've been in it the past five years, you know, it's constantly changing and there's always more to learn. And, you know, the ability to work alongside a lot of interesting organizations is really cool as well. Just the nature of um, being a Maz platform provider is that you have to cooperate. You have to work with a lot of exciting um, organizations that are doing a lot of cool things um, to, to improve sustainability outcomes. Um, and, you know, as, as you'd be well aware and many of the listeners as well, it's not just sustainability, it's accessibility. Um, it's about providing 
uh, mobility to, to people who perhaps don't have the ability to drive their own car or just you know, can't afford it. So, uh, yeah, there's a bit of that sense of uh, you know, doing good as well, which is, which is always nice. Uh, you just mentioned parking and it triggered um, the memory of an image you shared at the Roads and Traffic Expo mm. of a home built on a car space in Finland. Mm. Yeah. Can, can you send that image to me and maybe I can add it to uh, a post on this podcast? Mm-hmm. But I, I found that image quite profound and I, I think mm. many people take parking spaces for granted and mm. expect parking spaces to be there for them. Yeah. That concept of building a house on a car space in a public square in Finland mm. is so special, isn't it? Um, yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about that and and the company behind it? Do you know much about them? Yeah. So um, the company is is the one that I alluded to at the start. So so Wim, uh, w- one of the first organisations to to implement uh, a MAS service uh, within Helsinki. So. They, as part of a marketing activation, they did exactly that. So they, they took out, you know, they measured out uh, the, the footprint of a, of a car space or a car parking space, and they built a tiny home on top of it, which really you know, visually provides a very strong image of uh, what, what you can do when you start to think outside the box and um, start to think about, you know, once once we're able to reduce the amount of cars driving in and around cities, uh, what you could use that space for instead. So um, it is it is a sensitive topic because you know the, the it's not completely possible to remove car spaces um, in all situations, uh, and, and you know there's the idea of delivery vehicles and things like that as well. So there, there are very practical reasons why there are car spots, um, and yeah, but but just kind of as a as an overarching visual for um, what what Maz can do, um, I think that that was a really powerful one that just stuck in my mind as well. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll share that with you, and, and you can share that with your listeners. Mm, thank you, Max. It's been terrific to have you on our podcast. We appreciate the time and the stories you've told us. It really makes me think about how positive change can be and how fleet can be part of that. And um, maybe before you go, how optimistic are you that those changes are coming sooner and faster than we imagined a decade ago? Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, yeah, it, it, it is, it is, um, it is one of those things where, you know, you hear about the concepts uh, and before, before they're actually rolled out, before the organisations are, are running pilots, like, you kind of you're always you're always a bit skeptical, right? Like you, and particularly when there are companies in the past that have tried and and failed, um, you wonder if the public's kind of lost faith. So to be able to see things like the e-scooter trials doing so well, um, and especially you know post COVID as well, like um, that whole idea of, of sharing and and sharing germs and things. Uh, I mean, it doesn't seem to have slowed slowed it the adoption down at all. So um, it is really promising. It surprised me. And um, I think it's a, it's, it's definitely a, a good indicator of where, where the Maz movement as a whole is, is going. So I am, I am very optimistic with, um, with this. And, and yeah, I think, I think the most interesting thing for me isn't, you know, whether Maz is taking off or not. It definitely, it definitely will. It's just, um, yeah, how different, different countries and geographies, um, kind of evolve um we know that there's different different places around the world uh have different preferences and trends and uh, or as well evolve at different different rates but um yeah i think that that to me is the most interesting thing to see the shape that it takes max thanks for the chat thank you caroline really appreciate it You've been listening to Fleet Auto News Podcast. It was edited and produced by Isabella Fiorentino. Thank you again to our new sponsor, Sofico Services. It's great to have you on board. The original theme music for this podcast was created by Isabella Fiorentino. You can follow us on Spotify. Just search for Fleet Auto News. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. 
Our website is fleetautonews.com where you can get all our stories, videos and podcasts. Until next time, drive safely and take care. Thank you.